apex of humanity rising. Yesterday, we had our session on the Holocaust and how second generations of Holocaust survivors have been coping with that extraordinary trauma. We were all very, very deeply moved. About an hour after our session, I was looking at the news and I saw that Human Rights Watch, one of the largest and most respected human rights organizations in the world, uh, had officially designated Israel as an apartheid state. And that just struck me to the quick that Israel having endured what it has endured, the Jewish people, uh, would be so uh, brutalizing the Palestinian people uh, who were there um, before they arrived uh, in the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s and subsequently. Uh, it just struck me as one of the major contradictions of our time. And it made me reflect on the United States, for example. On the one hand, one of the great democracies, uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States is heralded by political sciences as uh, some of the greatest democratic examples in the history of civilization. And yet on the other hand, the United States is one of the most racist countries in the world. So I think we need to ponder that these great contradictions in the human psyche, and these great complexities that are really amalgamations of our light and shadow dimensions. As individuals, we have light and shadow dimensions. As communities, as nations, as races, we have light and shadow dimensions. We're always in a struggle within ourselves and with each other uh, because we haven't reached the level of coherence where everything can be harmonized as one. So I, I start our session uh, today on day 236 of Humanity Rising with deep humility and deep uh, respect uh, for the complexities of history and the complexities of the psyche in that spirit, let us take a moment and let us just pause. Let us center our attention on our bodies, take a few deep breaths and listen to our heartbeats, all of us. They're individual hearts, but they all beat in the end as one.
Thank you, everyone. And now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude for each and every one of you, I want to commence our program by just observing the complexity again and the urgent necessity for human beings everywhere in the world to develop new ways of communication and new ways of designing how human intelligence can come together to create new forms. And it's within that context that we're delighted to uh, talk today with the founding uh, chief executive officer of MindHive out of Australia, uh, Bruce Muirhead, uh, who has uh, decades of experience uh, in uh, using technology uh, for the human good. And when he founded MindHive, uh, he really set himself the challenge of how you create global conversations over time. Uh, you can think of MindHive actually as a, a very, very sophisticated version of our chats as we have our Zoom uh, uh, sessions. People come in, uh, and they just start to chat. They just start to interact. Well, MindHive is uh, a, a very sophisticated version of that so that specialists and experts and people of all kinds can enter into conversations with one another and uh, over time uh, begin to go into uh, both the uh, complexities, the inadequacies that they see and, and refine and make more uh, harmonized uh, conversations that are deeply important uh, in all kinds of domains from science to business to anthropology to culture to entertainment to sports uh, to politics to philosophy. Uh, so uh, Ubiquity University and Humanity Rising have been fashioning a partnership uh, with MindHive and we encourage everyone to uh, take a look uh, just go to mindhive.com. Uh, uh, we'll put the uh, link in the uh, chat box uh, as we proceed. So Bruce, I want to welcome you uh, to Humanity Rising. And let us begin to, with you just telling your story and uh, the pathway that you uh, trod uh, to come to a founding Mindhive. Welcome to Humanity Rising. That's a, it's a great question, um, Jim, because it enables, oftentimes these questions enable me to try and work it out backwards as, as, as it always goes. Um, so I've sort of been fortunate in my life to tend to be driven by phone calls rather than applications. So most of the things I've been involved in have been people having a conversation with me and, and moving down a pathway that um, is more serendipitous than planned. Um, and the other part, which um, I recently did a graduation speech at our local University of Queensland here in Australia, and it always forces you because you have to make some sense of your life to try and be in some ways more inspiring than the beer that the students are looking forward to drinking while you're talking. So the inspirations for me was well, what has been sort of the compartments of my life. And, and, and so I'll, I guess where, when I was... Um, I was actually a tennis player in my younger days, a competitive tennis player, and all my friends when we finished school went on the world circuit. And, um, and I decided I'd had a life situation within my family that um, at my broader family where I'd started to get um, to engage in some of the complexities of life. So I was a classic middle class kid who was going to go travel on the world circuit. My brother had been on it. Um, and uh, we just as life does it, it throws a curveball that you can cope with, but it was an unusual curveball for us. And we became more engaged in the prison world. And, um, and so I started to find myself visiting and going to prisons, working with people in prisons, and pre spent pretty much a decade building schools in prisons, uh, working in America, Europe, uh, London, 
Australia in highly complex environments, which required a lot of um, a lot of people around the table to solve one person's problem. And it was in an era where we use words like interagency, um, uh, wrap around collaboration, and it was 26 people trying to help. In this case, uh, an individual prisoner live their life in a more full way. Uh, understanding the uh, aspirations of their own well-being, mental health, physical health, spiritual health. And so I learned a lot basically sitting in cells with various people, um, sharing with them um, some learnings that I was experiencing throughout that period. That was pretty much a decade of my life. Um, and I remember sitting in a cell with a boy who murdered somebody and, um, and uh, thinking, I don't have the energy to deal with this sort of environment much anymore. And I literally at that day got a phone call from our Premier um, saying, would I be interested in setting up other schools in prisons and, and in other unused areas? Um, and it led another decade of work, which was in sort of more policy and politics. So <coughs> I went from a $1,500 budget per year to 11 and a half million with 245 staff. And I think I was in my early 30s. And it was a really um, exciting, challenging, eye-opening experience to look at, well, OK, I've been working in sort of social economic development on the grassroots level. But what, what about if you start putting political policy practice architecture of scaling some of those ideas? So I was fortunate, got quite close with some of the political leaders, got close to uh, government leaders particularly, <coughs> um, worked very much in that space of how can you take an idea and build a policy architecture? I was inspired by a man, um, Terry Moran, who was the secretary of our prime minister's office um, department. And he said, Bruce, if you can take one idea into a policy, it means you're giving uh, an opportunity to everyone in this country. So it's not just that person who's sitting in a suburb in an institution, it's actually enabling that. And it just, it, it still to this day inspires me. Terry has um, always been that person who's lifted a way of thinking. Um, and just by chance, again, the phone rang and said, the university said, well, listen, would you like to come and work with us on pulling together the academics professors to work on the city's problems. And so I established a place called the Boiler House, which we I found the, the worst building on the campus and asked whether I could have it for free to the vice chancellor of the day. And he said, you can have it for free if you can tidy it up. And we raised a few million dollars and tidied it up and had this beautiful architecturally um, designed boiler house with our community, local community. And I set aside a pathway there, which was to work with the university structure, the academy, with the leaders of the city on connecting ideas from the academy to the problems of the city. And that led to a, a story of engaging with most of the universities around Australia and in New Zealand. And again, a phone call from one of the ministers in South Africa saying, well, we'd like that here. And we'd like to work with Australia on common problems of, of um, early education, um, uh, productivity, uh, resources, water, space, and things like that. And so for the next 14 years, I spent working on basically traveling between two or three countries. And again, a lot of time in America and Europe, trying to connect up people and, uh, and solutions with problems of the countries. And on a simple premise that most countries have the same 20 problems, they just have them in different orders. I remember the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand saying that dog attacks was their third biggest problem. And, and, and we worked uh, closely uh, into the President's Planning Committee in South Africa, where there were issues, even issues to do with what are we doing worrying about space when we actually have townships of three and four million people in Talisha and, and, and Soweto and so forth. Um, and so understanding how you inspire countries, but also solve problems at that level. And it was actually, I might have um, shared this already with you, Jim, but for others who are listening, it was just a, a period where I remember flying to Johannesburg for dinner, um, a two hour dinner hosted uh, with, again, the President's Planning Committee was there with various vice chancellors from around the country and literally a two hour dinner and then hopped on the same flight back. And so it was a 26 hour flight return for a two hour dinner. And it just started hitting me. It's just, it's not sustainable to our earth that, or that those of us who are interested in connecting people and, and so forth, uh, consulting houses have known it increasingly over the last decade that we're, those who are dealing in problem solving are traveling a lot. 
and and um, and so a whole bunch of things, ideas collided, which was what if you could get out of the way and allow some technology and a platform to become that connector, problem solvers, problem owners connecting. And MindHive was born from a conversation with a very close friend who sort of said to me, Bruce, um, you're, what you're trying to establish is just something like an ISP platform. Since those days, we've looked more at shared economy, like an Airbnb for brains. Harvard Business believes that we've all got four to six hours a day we could be you know, giving to um, solving issues or contributing to insight, our insights. Um, the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful um, visual to understand the opportunity we currently have on Earth. And Rick, I have given, um, shared a, a link with you to a video which we put together, which was Diamond, Diamondus, I think his name is Peter Diamondus speaking. He wrote a, a really powerful piece about the speed of connection that's happening right now. And I know with ubiquity and humanity rising, we all see it, we all understand it. But what we're trying to do now is get there faster by sort of almost getting out of the way and allowing our, each other individuals, wherever we live, to participate in problem solving. But Rick, if you had, it's about a one minute video, but it, it captures, I guess, where we are now, which is the opportunity. Um, and my life lived has been a whole series of different ways of solving problems. But I'd have to say right now feels the most exciting and the most likely to solve unsolvable problems that we've been dealing with over the past decades. <clears throat> Only 20 years ago, about one quarter of the Earth's population, some 1.8 billion people were connected to the internet. By 2017, that penetration had reached 3.8 billion people, or about half the globe. But over the next 12 years, we're going to wire up the rest of humanity, adding 4.2 billion new minds to the global conversation. Soon, all 8 billion of us, every single human, will be networked together at gigabit speeds. If network size, density and fluidity have turned cities into the best transformation engines we've yet been able to create, then the fact that we are about to link the entire globe into a single network means the whole planet is just a few years away from becoming the largest innovation lab in history. So Jim, that's my story today. Well, that's a beautiful uh, start, uh, Bruce. Thank you so much. You know, what you're saying in the video we just saw reminds me of Peter Russell's book, uh, Global Brain, uh, right. published uh, uh, very, very uh, positively several years ago. And then before him back, you know, 75 years ago, Teilhard de Chardin, uh, the, uh, the Jesuit, uh, paleontologist uh, talked about the newosphere, that the next phase of, of human evolution uh, was moving from information to mind. And I would just uh, yes. love to hear your thoughts on how you're viewing uh, the human future, because I think you're onto something. And I love the term mind hive. Uh, you know, th yeah. that, uh, it's, it's a uh, it's, uh, it's where humanity is headed at an increasing velocity and how we understand it, how we embrace it and how we shape it is in some ways uh, the most uh, important question of our time. Uh, but I, before going into the particulars of mind, <coughs> I'd love to have your sort of more philosophical metaphysical yeah. thoughts on human evolution where you think we're at and how you you conceive of this movement into a single integrated human intelligence around planet earth jim i guess for me it's been the probably the most exciting part of this has been to participate in this experiment as a learner as much as a uh, um and it's the benefit sometimes in those that earlier part of my life, you felt like you could claim leadership just because of years of experience. I, I, I just had four students from our university begin working with us on um, the idea of can you own an idea? Can you potentially tokenize and blockchain an idea? There was never a period in my life I knew I'd be having that conversation with a group of 20 year olds who knew way more than I did. Um, so I'm not sure what's happening here because I think 
I think if I had to talk personally, um, uh, everything's been thrown up in the air for us at the moment, and particularly we've I've been living in a in a um, in a in a period where uh, uh, expertise is um, has been crafted in a certain way and designed in a certain way that I I've participated where I believe there have been experts in my life. Um, I think that the current how I've been thinking about um, human intelligence is that expertise has been redefined. It's fragmenting. Uh, smoke and mirrors of consulting houses is arriving. That that there's been a bit of a game being played about who are the experts and who aren't. And so for me, one of the most uh, encouraging sights is that um, uh, my chair and I, Lindley Edwards, and I often talk about the insights can come from the strangest places. And in growing up, it's always been insights have come from the hill, from the professor of mentoring, or it comes from your supervisor, or it comes. And so for, for us, re-identifying that expertise has a, there's a huge opportunity now for people to put more people to participate in some of the challenges we're solving because they're not cut out. And so for me, the wonderful period that we're in at the moment is that it isn't a set of 26 professionals sitting around necessarily someone who's needing their help. There's a there's a there's a power of many um, that's appearing that's enabling that's very real. And sitting with these students and hearing one boy's mixing physics with gamification and technology and and not sure where it's going to take him, but he's the most one of the most attractive sort of thinkers that I've met at that age because he's bringing together a multitude of of thought. Another fellow is working; uh, he's doing history and technology and wanting to mix humanities and technology and so and no one can claim that it's oh, well you're not going to get a job with that because they're immediately employable from the way they're thinking and and uh and just the process of their of their in, inter, interrogation of ideas and their movement towards solutions and so forth so so i, I think oh, where we are at the moment is this, this sort of unusual space you, you know it in a very pragmatic way when most of the senior executives of consulting houses are jumping off into startups where they can experiment with a lot of this idea of human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Well, you know, I, I think that's, yeah. that's a very important point that you're making. It reminds me of an IBM study <clears throat> that I read uh, back in, in 2010, uh, which actually completely yeah. changed my life and motivated uh, uh, me and a group of us to found Ubiquity University. And it was saying uh, they interviewed, I think, 1,700 CEOs and 3,600 students in 60 countries around the world. And their conclusion was there wasn't a single academic institution anywhere that uh, was enabling students to deal with hypercomplexity. And one of the right. ways that they defined hypercomplexity uh, in the first instance, that it, it is a situation where any event anywhere can ricochet through the global system and have effects unexpectedly anywhere or everywhere. And yes. the implications of that, they said, for human intelligence, which you're on to with MindHive, is they said hypercomplexity is a state of complex complexities where no single mind is any longer capable of understanding the whole. The only way to navigate through hypercomplexity is mm -hmm. collaboratively. Yes. And that was important to us at Ubiquity because all of our learning is, is collaborative. What we're doing on Humanity Rising is in the spirit of what we call radical collaboration. So I think that's one of the foundational insights in our world today that intelligence needs to be collective and the more diversified the intelligence is the more creatively it can solve whatever problems that are at hand I mean, absolutely experience would you uh, say anything uh, other than that i mean it's uh, it seems to me to be a, a foundational statement for the human future it is collaboration is the key yeah, and we so this concept of collective intelligence, even Google search, you're seeing this sort of rise of the, the mainstreaming of collective intelligence. Um, uh, it, 
it's kind of, I guess, for again the twenty-year-old and even younger, it's kind of just it, it is what it is. So you'll often hear the term "we'd love to make mind" type of verb for problem solving um, because it's, it enables. But hive mind is, often gets used. But this notion of um, a global mind. Jeff Mulgan wrote a recent book just from Nesta, and I, he's now left Nesta, but he's probably the foremost theorist in this area. He's he's and he's also quite um, rigorous about his. Uh, his, uh, the gospel of the power of many may need to be in, in, interrogated as well, um, that crowds can be dumb, you know, and, and that crowds, crowds aren't always necessarily right. Um, and so there's a heavy level, I think, of curation that Ubiquity and, and other groups, uh, there needs to be the orchestrators of innovation networks, not just an innovation network. So orchestration, curation, these things will become very, uh, they are now, and it's for, for us, we're learning it. How do, we're asking ourselves the question, how do you curate online collaborations in, in, a, in, in a way that's maybe the same, different, or a both and to offline, you know, face to face. But um, so collective intelligence as a, as a framing of this sort of movement needs to be interrogated. Um, not all problems need to be crowdsourced. Not all problems need to go to a crowd. There's, and so there's this notion of um, when and how and who. Um, so again, yesterday I was introduced to a new tech, a new platform called Lunch Room, I think it's called. And it's video um, uh, matchmaking for 45 minutes and AI will match you with the person you're meant to meet. Now it looks, it's very exciting. It's one of a multitude, you know, and, and you can see that in um, Run the World, a whole bunch of new technologies is the first thing we're learning about is how do you match, ma the first thing everyone's working on effectively is that matchmaking. How do you match make unusual suspects? How do you, um, I've met you through a, a mutual friend and that's a very typical way of meeting someone um, but it's the people you meet when you sit on a plane and sit down beside them and, and you've, it's complete um, serendipity, those meetings. But how can, there's a young woman running a, a, a global, I think a potential future unicorn who found that in San Francisco, she was struggling with collective intelligence around investment and so forth because she felt young women weren't getting access to the same networks the young men were getting access to in San Francisco. So she built an AI that democratised matchmaking, you know, that allowed anybody to matchmake with the likelihoodness of meeting the CEO or the VC rather than just who you knew. So I think it's wonderful period. I think it's a period where ubiquity is probably this is your moment. Ten years ago it was probably... Um, arguing against uh, traditional systems, um, whether the universe, sandstone in Australia, we call them sandstones. I think, what's the term for a sandstone in America? It's a um, the top 10 universities. What's their group called? The Ivy League. Yeah, you know. yeah so there's that, there's always been that. I, I was very close with the um, University of uh, Pennsylvania and it was, an, it was always wanting to be and was an Ivy League university and had huge impact on its local community through people like Ira Harkavy and others. But... I just wonder now that with consulting houses, Ivy Leagues and Sandstones, whether there's this new opportunity now that what you're doing with Ubiquity and Humanity Rising is enabling participants who wouldn't typically be participants in learning in new ways. Um, so this broadening to crowds, I think is a mega trend. Um, it was a bit of an anti-trend initially, the people who resisted. And now I think it's a mega trend um, that, that crowds um, from whether you're designing another product at Lego through to where you're a political leader needing to get your story understood, your, your narrative understood, crowds are, are critical for the success of any entity. Um, it's, so I, I think just the collective intelligence world has enabled this question, which is what is expertise? What is insight? Um, who owns insight? Um, how, does, how do you share insight? Um, and, and in this mind, even post COVID, um, where is the insight? Because it's, I'm sitting in a room that no one knows where I am. I'm in a co-working space. I've left a traditional office. I'm sitting with 190 other companies in this room. I've spent five months working from my rumpus room with 10 staff. Expertise is, is everywhere. So, so it's very, so it's no longer the, you know, the bastion of the 300 uh, 
big four consulting firms on three floors you know, in the downtown type of thing. So, Well, I think that's, that's right. And uh, uh, I want to just circle back for a moment, uh, uh, Bruce, because I think you uh, made a, a very important point sort of in passing, but I'd like to just pause because I think there's a big difference between a crowd and a mob. Yes. And uh, what we're seeing through social media is the creation of silos and yes. parallel universes. And then Facebook and Google then reinforce whatever point of view, whether it's you know a racist point of view or a environmentally sensitive point of view. And then pretty soon you're aggregating yourself in a group um, that believes just like you do. Uh, and the next thing you know, you've got a, somebody like Trump uh, who's uh, engaging in the worst form of demagoguery and false news. And the next exactly. thing you, know, you have an insurrection and uh, attempt against the US Capitol like we saw on January 6th. So I'd love to have your comment on the, 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 the nuance that we need, the sophistication with which we need to approach any kind of hive mind or mind hive or uh, 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 interconnectivity through the internet because there's an ethical dimension to all this. Yeah, absolutely. And it requires strong vision and real um, a vision um, that, that can motivate people so that the, the orchestra is only as strong as the conductor. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen it in a number of different ways. We're very close with different groups around the world who, who are uh, in practice and theory of deliberative democracy, whereby there's citizen juries and there's, it's, it's quite a considered methodology to achieve an outcome. And it's, um, and not everyone wakes up in the morning and says they want to participate in a considered methodology. Some people just want to get up and tweet their frustration. And so one of the challenges for platforms which are more deliberative or deeper, or there's a wonderful platform called Kyala, I think it's out of Europe, which tries to bring together left and right, green and red, and tries to, tries to allow that conversation to percolate over a period of time so that, the, that rather than you know, two countries in one or, or an either or approach, it's a both and approach. Mm -hmm. um, how they're going about it, I think, which is interesting, is they're bringing it into the education sphere. So they're bringing it into schools where young people can start using platforms that enable them to have debate, which is considered an over time, um, rather than instantaneous social media type of platform. When Facebook was being, uh, um, it was in uh, just within Australia, particularly Facebook in Australia had a bit of a clash, you may be aware at the end of last year about um, pricing yes. for news and, and content. It gave huge rise to all of us. We all felt this moment could be ours where we could have an alternative for people to participate in. And it's created an ongoing discussion. It's even on my type the discussions around, is it time for the benefit of the world to have platforms? And I see, Jim, Ubiquity as a platform. It's, it, it may be you know, in, in all various ways. I'm using the term quite openly as a platform of people uh, learn teaching and learning. Um, I, I guess what we're doing here is an opportunity for me to teach about a particular idea and a, and a, and a pragmatic outcome and so, something we're building. That's one of the, of the things yeah. that we did very early on because we, mm. we were aware of what Facebook was doing, other platforms where they're commodifying the, the, uh, the consumer without the consumer's awareness. Uh, uh, they are uh, invading privacy. As you know, we all know they're tracking us every second of the day, every time we text or chat or video. Well, call. they probably know you and I are talking right now, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> we 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 decided that we were gonna, even though we're small, you know, we're a little uh, gnat on the buffalo's back of, of Facebook. We decided to build our own platform, which is called the Ubiverse, and uh, right. Uh, yeah. We brought it online as specifically as an alternative where the user uh, is honored, um, the privacy is respected, uh, nothing is commodified, uh, and it has an ethical uh, orientation around change makers, innovation, and people trying to uh, 
uh, make a, a better world. And, you know, within uh, just a few months now, we, we've got, uh, you know, 10, 15,000 users and, and I think over a thousand different organizations and, and uh, people are, are, are coming on uh, every single day and Humanity Rising uh, uses the, the UBiverse. So I think you're right that, that um, we're at a moment where those of us who see for, uh, see for a, f a better world um, need to use the instrumentality that's out there. And it's an extraordinary thing. You know, just through Zoom, Humanity Rising is pumping out over 40 plus partner channels every single day to 15, 20, sometimes oh, 30,000 yeah. people all over the world, I think in over 130 countries now, and it's all for free. So the, the, the power of this technology and the potential um, uh, of this technology is almost beyond imagination. Mm. And we're at the, kind of the, the edge of that ocean our generation is yes. yes. that ocean and it's very exciting. And I think it's within this context, I'd love to have you start to share what you folks are doing uh, uh, at MindHive uh, because we're For very sure. eager to partner with you and uh, we wanna make MindHive available to all of our humanity rising uh, 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 listeners and, and participants. So tell us about MindHive. What are you folks up to and what's your vision and, and what are you offering? Well, why don't I, um, I guess in, in, as a company, uh, we focus on, um, we're an impact investment. So we're, we're seeking to build a business which is sustainable, but also contributes to a better world. So we were born in 2017. Uh, we raised a couple, $2 million here in Australia, which got us a team to start building. Um, We'd have what they we had what they call an MVP, I guess, of a of a platform, um, and we'd had a number of um, partners in that, from the Prime Minister's Department right through to um, other corporates, right to about ten thousand people had joined the platform to participate. Um, over the last few years, we've been just building new features, um, learning. We're in a constant state of learning, so I, I we are definitely an experiment. Um, uh, we're an experiment in uh, abundant thinking as much as anything else. I remember sitting with a fellow, um, uh, Rich Arnold in San Francisco, and he said to me, Bruce, how much do you need? Um, and I said, oh, two million. He goes, no, you need a hundred million. And how many developers do you need? And I said, I need four developers. He goes, you need a hundred developers. <laughs> and so it's this sort of idea of, where do you need to be putting your, how do these new experiments that we're doing, how do we scale them to have that impact? Um, and what, and so we've been on this journey at the moment where we currently, we're doing some pretty cool stuff. I want to show you a couple of quick ones here. Um, let me just see how I can, um, I'm not sure if you can see that, Jim. Only 20 yeah. years ago about what, yeah, so, and I guess we like that notion of maybe there's an innovation lab on Earth and it's just the Earth is an innovation lab. Uh, we've loved those ideas of things called smart cities, but they've been probably more technically thought about. But we love this idea of, um, of, um, of uh, the innovation space. I'll share this with you to share with others. I'll just quickly go through it. We're really, we've started to understand that people do have some spare time, just as much as you might have a spare bedroom that you can rent and get some additional revenue, you might have spare time. So we're starting to see this idea of how can we build this community of insight? Um, a friend said to me, we've all become better photographers um, because of Instagram, because, you know, if you want to look, if you want to, if you want to look, um, if you want to look thinner than what you are, you take a photo like this, you know, now I didn't know that before, but if, but my wife's a photographer and she thought it's going to be the end of photography. But if anything, everyone seems to be walking now around with a SLR camera and it's a visual and that, but we were as much as Instagram's maybe made us all um, uh, better photographers. We'd love to think that MindHive's going to it helps people become more insightful over time and the world a more insightful place. So as I said, we believe we've got that power to connect. We think 
like you, we don't want to build everything, but there's just so many tools at the moment. You know, online whiteboards. You could have. Uh, we're in a co-working space. We could put. 50 tools on the platform now and just share them and let people start experiencing ways to surface insights. Um, hence, with our partnership with you, we'd be thinking that we're, we're like an insight platform that we, all of the discussion transcriptions, we can surface insights that are hidden. Uh, I think you said before, let's pause for a minute and go back and think about um, this idea that you've just spoken about. That's mind time. We're just simply a virtual space. So we're democratizing insight we believe, um, uh, and we're disrupting the traditional uh, owners of insight, consulting houses, universities, and so forth. Mm. Ours is a simple model. You ask a question, you invite public or private groups, small. You, there's some simple insight mapping, which I can show you. There's deeper discussions. So I guess we're moving out of social media here and talking more about a considered discussion. It's beyond LinkedIn groups, it's a bit more it's far more interactive. In fact, MindHive is getting smarter every minute of the day. You have an instant reporting process and so forth. It's, um, there's been really nice examples of how collective intelligence have solved problems. And I'm sure you've got those through your world, but you know, uh, Steve Sargent who ran General Electric said 55 year old blokes with a watch like this, we should be able to text them three hours before their heart attack and tell them you're gonna have a heart attack get to hospital. So predictive medicine was, you know, and typically if I asked you who solved that problem, we typically think like a procurement mind. We typically go, well, it'll be a health institute at you know, UCLA or it'll be a, a health private company, um, CSL. Or, but it was actually two 30-year-old hedge funders in New York solved that problem. And they, they were looking at financial algorithms and their correlation to health and um, Who's the most likely person to walk through a hospital door? Again, General Electric is increasingly using Kaggle, a platform in data science, crowdsourcing, crowding, crowdsourcing data scientists. Google, um, Google Air just bought them, um, but effectively gave them a postcode of data or a district of data and said, who do you think is the person that's going to walk through the door of the hospital next? Uh, a dentist in Thailand won that. Um, who can beat the time to clean up the oil spill in, in Florida? A tattoo artist, uh, a, a tattoo artist in Florida was on this in the semi-finalist team who contributed to the ultimate success of that under Obama. So expertise is fragmented, expertise is being redefined. Yes. Organizations are kind of wanting to get more, you know, their, their teams more, you know, you could argue that all, the future of consulting is that organizations solve their own problems with their own insights internally. And more of us, you know, we've asked our community, what do you want? They really want to connect with others. And, and that's what you're tapping into with ubiquity and, and, and humanity rise. And people do want to connect and so forth. I won't go too much into this, but we have a, we have a philosophy around this notion of a platform commons, like you talked about, honoring people, trust and so forth. We, we're also data driven, so we are interested in how you can quickly get to meet the, the unusual suspect. Um, we're also about seeding our community and, and, and nurturing our community. So this is cool. Um, these are tools, these are features we're building, but I just love them. We've, got, we've been really fortunate to partner with our local university who's offering us 12 and a half thousand hours of student time this year with their best and brightest in machine learning, AI, blockchain. And you don't have to be too much brighter than me. To, like, these guys are impressive. They're, they're very enthusiastic. But imagine if when we're on the internet, we can be highlighting insights on anything we're seeing. So like Medium, the platform, what if we could highlight insights and pull those insights in? Right now, MindHive is just thinking about, well, how can we start to surface high? How can we just use a simple notion of highlighting something we're reading that pulls it into a place that we can keep it? How can you know, uh, how can we how can we have something which is like a wild card AI? It's not the winds. I love windsurfing, so I want to meet someone else who loves windsurfing. It's I'm going to meet someone who's actually solved problems that could be helpful for me. So we're building and spending a lot of time on what's called an AI matchmaking, which is where we're trying to align unconnected pairings of people to actually try and solve unsolvable problems. We're kind of having a cool time with this idea of building tribes and communities. And you spoke about it before. 
we don't want those tribes to be either or tribes. You know, I I like this, I hate that, um, but more about bringing together a sense of um, leadership um, curation to that. We want to be able to share everyone's innovation. So there's lots of tools we want to throw in. So for example, Jim, if, you know, with um, Humanity Rising Ubiquity, there may be times where people will say, well, let's get together, transcribe our discussion, let's use some tools to surface a report out of our discussion. Um, this is an area that obviously we're interested with you guys with that academy, acknowledging and honouring people in our community for solving problems. But just you know how I was saying about the watch and predicting a heart attack. What if we could? What if we could get three thousand pages of content and ask a platform to say, well, knowing me, where do you think? Where do the insights that I'm willing, I'm wanting to learn about? And so with this idea of insight prediction is a very interesting idea it's quite it's going to be a year-long project this year for us understanding you know you may have ideas where you're thinking maybe the time's right for this we've had a investment company come to us and say listen we believe in the future of technology we just don't know whether the community is ready for a cryptocurrency fund and so just going out and asking people what is where are you up to with this understanding around the future of finance and so forth um, in Australia, we have this colloquialism, yeah, nah, which is yes, no. And it's this idea of, can we just get quickly to the where you, where's your starting point and so forth. And then finally, this notion of, I wonder whether we can tokenize an insight, whether ubiquity could be understanding all of the students, all of the participants, all the lecturers uh, in that community, where did my insights go? Uh, in the academic world, you can sort of see that happening in certain ways, but this one's had the most interest from both universities um, and, and, and individuals, which is, you know, if I've said something, so it would be wonderful to know where that insight gets used in other settings. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of a snapshot of what we're working on, both, um, I'll get out of that. Yeah. Bruce, uh, why don't you uh, just walk us through uh, someone uh, out of humanity rising uh, wants to join uh, the mind hive. Just walk us through what happens and what they initially encounter. And sure. uh, with all the opportunities that you just laid out, what's the most likely, what are most people doing on mind hive? Just walk Let's have a look. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, I love showing this because it's, um, there's an opportunity here, um, I think, in various countries for various reasons. I think Black Lives Matter use Google Docs as their main organising platform. Um, you never know where your platform, when you build these platforms, you never know where it's going to become most useful. Right now, it seems to be, if you're looking at discussions just in the last 24 hours, <clears throat> Australia did very well with its COVID protection. Um, but we're not doing very well in rolling out our vaccinations. And so someone's asking here, you know, there's a question here which someone's asking about COVID vaccinations. Someone's concerned about um, relationships here in our region. Um, someone's concerned about the future of work post COVID, a number of people getting in, invested in that. This fellow rang me on the weekend actually and said, listen, I just think 88% of, he was saying to me, 90% of boards won't admit to a project failure and they just keep letting it fail. And that's become quite a contentious discussion, which is, <clears throat> when do you say, we're not going to continue that project? Um, so <clears throat> there's all different discussions here. Some people are saying virtual parties just aren't fun. This is a group in, in London who's doing this, like, let's stop faking it. You know, everyone's saying virtual parties are fun. We want to have, we want to have something else there. So they're looking at reality. Um, so there are individuals asking questions which are important to them. There is, there is a whole variety of questions being asked right now that people, you can post a question. Um, I'll just show you how to post a question pretty quickly so here. A person, a person signs into MindHive yeah, they can join any one of those discussion groups. That they, they can support. join. They can ask to join. But let's create one ourselves um, here. Um, and um, 
what would be the uh, what would be the hoped for outcome of this discussion, Jim? And we could invite some of the community. What would you hope from our discussion? Hope humanity rising and Mindhive collaborate uh, to. to work for a better world. So we can, and the nice thing about platforms again like this um, is that you, you're you always editing. So we're not gonna to worry too much about um, getting it right. We can come back to it. So, um, and then basically we've learned that if you can pop up a question um, uh, pretty quickly and, and get it out there going, you can keep building it. So. Um, where's one of those ones? So, so in this instance, um, and I won't use the term, I won't write it here, but it would take us about five minutes just to come up with what are the sort of questions we'd like to ask and what's some background on our issues. So right now we've talked a little bit of that. So we could be transcribing our discussion so far and putting it into mind time and asking people, I love when you said, let's pause for a minute. And in some ways, what we could do with our transcription, we often do it. We we have an AI program called Notive that just that partners with us that we can just transcribe it, put it up, and people start highlighting what they thought were insights. So oftentimes after a discussion, it, it's hard to remember what they were. We can add resources. We could put in some of the humanity rising resources around collective intelligence, collective insight, power of many, and so forth. We can talk about community and digital life. Uh, lifestyle and so forth. Um, we can tag it. Um, once we once we've set our question up, we can say, well, listen, we will. Uh, we're going to allow people to say incognito comments because sometimes that's more people find it easy to be more truthful about yeah. practices. We'll start it today, but let's finish it um, Monday week. We can have a discussion and then we can highlight at the same time. So and I'll show you that. What we'll do just for the sake of, we don't want this to go public because it's a demo, but we'll, we'll have a private discussion um, and we'll have it as invite only. And 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 I can invite you, I can type, um, well here I can invite my one of my team just so, because I know they're, um, I can invite Michelle to it. And so Michelle's in the team, or I can ask for curated suggestions um, from Mindhive, I can ask for invite, email, I can then upload my CV um, and so forth. Um, I can assign administration rights, I can conclude. I, I guess going back there to, to the people one day, one of the one of the nice ones there is when you what Mindhive, what this is, remember I was talking about the wildcard algorithm and, and so forth. This is you can meet people who have similar interests, people who have similar skills. Or you can meet people who've been solving problems. Robin's the ex deputy of University of Western Australia. Um, Amanda's a consultant, and so forth. We can invite them to the discussion. So Mindhive can link you to the the known suspects and to the unknown suspects. Once we launch our discussion, that's it, and it's off and racing. Um, while that's um, launching. Um, so we've got our discussion and we can begin um, a topic um, effectively um, there. So if we go back, you'll be able to see um, here, if I just refresh, hopefully we'll have our topic up and, um, and it will be uh, available for discussion and we can start building that out. One of the cool ones that I, sh I, that I like, sorry, Jim. That was just very cool. It's really cool and it's nice because I can say it's cool because I didn't build it. It's, it's, I love celebrating the developers, the designers, the product. Head. But this one here I've been hosting for just under a year. There's 530 people participating, representing expert networks, GLG, McKinsey's, 10 EQS, through to all the consulting houses. And I'm trying to stir things up a little bit. I'm trying to give a question which is, I reckon the future of consulting is a bit wobbly at the moment. Um, it doesn't say their share price isn't going up and they're not doing well in the business side, but just the way we share and sell and, and, and impart insights. People want things faster. They don't want a report 
two months after the gig. They also don't want a report that tells them what they already knew. They're much more. So what's happening here is I hosted the question. I'm putting it up there. Um, some people have highlighted, I've highlighted, people are communicating their thoughts on the questions. Um, Mark's jumped out of McKinsey into 10 EQS. He's talking about like, for example, daily rates. They've, that's not gonna stay too much longer. People wanna pay for outcomes. And so there's heaps and heaps of discussion here. Each time someone highlights uh, an insight, uh, it's put on to, that's, if you sort of pretend that that discussion is kind of like being at a round table with butcher's paper and whiteboards, ideate stickies. So if each highlight becomes a sticky. So when you said to me before, Bruce, let's pause for a minute, let's go back to crowd versus mob, that would be an insight. And that would appear here, crowd versus mob as an insight. And, and we'd interrogate it a bit more. Mm -hmm. If it was a dinner party, it'd be the sort of thing I said to you when I arrived, Geez, you know, the crazy the mob going crazy or whatever. And maybe by the time we got to dessert that night, we'd be saying, listen, what do we do about this crowd mob, you know, either or situation? So this doc, this this is pulling out insights as we go. It's you know, consulting's on dependent on manual human later. <coughs> um, it, it's competing. Uh, you know, there's a whole there's a whole series of ideation here. What we've what we've just about to launch is a very cool thing here, which is um, uh, let me have a look here. Communicate. Maybe I've not got it. I don't have it there, but we, we've got an instant report now. So when you finish, people can pull this report, which gives you all the stats, the number one insight, the people who've led it, and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's, I could probably, you know, there's heaps of resources that people are sharing about the future of consulting. Um, there's heaps of really interesting people that are, from here, I'm going to invite some of these people um, into future discussions specifically because of what they've been saying. Um, really powerful group of people that could be mobilised, for example, they could be interested in a, in a course on the future of insight. Um, so people might, in, the, in mind, I might say, well, listen, why don't we build a course on the future of what insight looks like and, and invite that group. Um, so there's market opportunities and so forth. Beautiful, beautiful. That's, uh, that's very exciting. And since you're the founder and the, the, the CEO, uh, what's your vision over the next two to three years for MindHive? Where would you like MindHive to be, yeah. let's say by 2025? We, we believe we have the capacity to scale our growth to a quarter of a million people by Christmas this year. We just met last night. That's, it. That's involving a whole series of different, um, uh, it's identifying partners, for example, like yourselves, where we've just opened up to partnership and to also to give away. Um, we feel like it's an opportunity to work with those founding partners to really share the tool, share the platform. Um, we would anticipate by 2025 that we're a company that's completely self-sufficient. Right now, we're taking uh, about, last year we raised about a million dollars over three forms of crowdfunding, um, internal to our existing investors, then to wholesale, then to retail. We'd like to think that we're at a, we have a valuation pathway where we'd like to get to. So we're running it. My board is a very powerful board, as you know, through Lindley and, and others as a absolute commitment to act in an impact investment um, philosophical way but there's also a responsibility to build a sound and sustainable company um, so we're anticipating about 2.5 3.5 million people in five years time um, would be our, our growth we we think that we will be probably part uh, if we can raise the necessary funds we can scale more we've got different scenarios but we'd like to think that within our partnerships, we can we can scale most. Our growth of community, our mind is the most effective sort of strategy to grow that community. Um, our product features, we've just doubled our development team as of this last Monday. Um, so that doubling has taken us to ability to get to our through our product pathway a lot faster than what we anticipated. Um, our ultimate goal would be to be a platform on earth that is available to not-for-profits for free, for you know, educational institutions for free, and then to generate revenue in some, one of the revenue streams is through enterprise using it internally. 
So we've had all big four consulting houses express interest in trialing as a tool in their own consulting, but also we've had lots of interest from larger companies, DLA, Piper and others who have said, listen, we could be internal. Um, and in, the more you let go, the more interesting the outcome. So one, one group's building a world reality, virtual reality conference site, and they'd like to have a Mindhive pavilion where even if you're at the bar, you might say to people, you know, the virtual bar, you might say to people, I'm happy for all my insights, whether I'm there on a panel, keynote speaking, all of a sudden this notion of a two day conference is finishing in many ways. It's why would the conference end? So mind have, you know, rapidly sourcing and surfacing insights as a place in so many. Um, if we really made it, I'd probably, we'd probably buy LinkedIn, buy Facebook, probably close down Facebook and just make LinkedIn our thing, you know, uh, our sandpit. So. <laughs> That's if Elon Musk doesn't do it before us. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm so struck, Bruce, by the sort of the parallels between Mindhive and Ubiquity. We started off very small uh, with hmm. a group of us that were just committed to bringing into the world a new form of holistic education. And our chief innovation officer, Peter Mary, had this vision of uh, competency-based uh, learning uh, that would uh, create a, a, a competency passport because uh, we knew that the handwriting was on the wall for conditional yeah. education of tests and grades and diplomas. Uh, and uh, when we took all this to the uh, creditors in California, uh, this was back, you know, 2000. Uh, 10, 11, they said, you're crazy. This is, this is not going to happen. So we had to go offshore and we raised money and, and uh, uh, Lindley was, was one of our students. She took a PhD uh, from our uh, uh, university uh, in the extraordinary subject of what global economics would look like if it was based on Aboriginal thinking. And right. A, a you know, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant PhD. Uh, you know, then we beavered away like Mindhive did to get our products together. And now, you know, with 2020, we were all set to launch out into the world. And then the pandemic happened. Yeah. All of a sudden, everything that we thought we were doing uh, in January of 2020 went into a uh, a miasm of COVID-19 and the coronavirus and, and our world was stopped. And then in the middle of all that, we were looking for what to do and out pops humanity rising, you know, because like you, you know, you, you understand that every crisis is actually the shadow side of an opportunity. And oh, last year was by far our awakening. Um, yeah. It was an awakening on the basis that I didn't have to explain anymore about collaborative software. So when I, I just noticed when I was talking to investors and participants, and we have we have retail, so we have 300 individual investors from $250 to $10,000. And, and in the past, I've sort of had to offer a, a carton of red wine and an 80 page book for people to understand what we're trying to create here in collective intelligence. It, it, yeah, yeah, it did not take, it was just like instance, like you don't have to explain, I get it because we're all working, like it just, yeah. someone said, you know, there's a common statement, which is it brought the tech revolution 20 years early. Um, and so for us, we were ready for it. Um, and then I, I just, yeah. this is what, this is one of the ones that I find fascinating, Jim, I'll just share this as a, because it because for some it's it's an awakening and an opportunity and for others it's a it's an evolution of their current model and so if you look at just all the just when you were talking about universities and and i think this is not dissimilar to universities that um jeff has been working with the university of london on using collective intelligence as a form of pedagogy so that students, when they go to the university, are actually solving world problems. That's where they want to be. They don't want to learn about an education system that doesn't work anymore or work environments not actually real. So I think big institutions are facing these massive tilts. Like, and you can see these are these are considered. Um, uh, this is Harvard Business Review. This is the Economist. These, this is people saying, you know what? 
Um, SWAT teams are set to transform the way gig economy is coming in, but we, we've got to be careful. It's, it's an honest, trusted platform and so forth. So I think we can find disruption occurring over here yeah. on tradition. And I do, I honestly believe it's ubiquity and uh, Ubiverse and all it's the, it, this is the moment where there's an opportunity to redesign how insights are shared and how insights have impact. And, and uh, it doesn't exclude the existing, but it certainly is an evolution period of um, particularly yeah. institutions. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I just was coming into my mind as, as we wrap up, I'd love to get your comment on this, you know, historians, when they are asked, what is the apogee moment of human civilization? Mm. Uh, many of them point to ancient Greece, mm. that golden age of Greece in the, in the uh, uh, fifth century BC uh, to about the middle of the of the third century is, 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 is called the golden age. And the central reason is because never before or since in human history have so many disciplines achieved such great genius as happened in Athenian democracy during that time. If you look at almost every sector of human society, whether it's medicine or philosophy or science or economics or politics, there was this upsurge of genius among those Greeks. And uh, that same thing is happening now today. And it's being catalyzed, as you just said, by the pandemic. We're now in a world where every single sector of human society is yes. going through a radical transformation <clears throat> simultaneously. Yeah, it's exciting. And it's, it's challenging, exciting. exciting, and there's some urgent work to be done on it. And I know our work particularly around the mental health side of isolation and for some communities. So there's this, whilst it's an opportunity for some, it's a responsibility also. So yeah, there's a there's a huge moment for us. And I, and I don't, someone said to me the other day, um, <clears throat> Duncan Davidson, who's an invest, uh, a VC in, in um, bullpen capital, I think up in San Fran, is that he's very interested in the world fair <clears throat> and how the world fair potentially could be rethought, redesigned. So we're working with one of the, we're working with a partner on the future of the Olympics. Um, yes. I, I love the fact that we can, we're reimagining more than redesigning. We're reimagining what exactly. And exactly. so I think the benefit of the partnership that we've got together is that if we have at the core of it the reimagination of edu of, of a whole series of things, then then we're not. I think you you said last time, or who was it? Ben said, you know, not thinking out of the box. Don't get in the box. You know, it's a exactly. it's that, that sort of thing. This is an opportunity to. The minute someone said to me, well, why would a conference have an end day? and a starting day, um, why wouldn't the conference just be running all year in different ways? Like, it's hard to explain why we've ended up with, why Why as an expert, someone who spends their whole life in an institution that potentially is dominated by peer review of their own pe their own tribe reviewing their own, you know. Uh, so there's a whole lot of questions which naturally would be exciting to ask together. Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Bruce, I really want to appreciate your enthusiasm and your incisiveness well, around you. these, these issues because we're in an extraordinary moment uh, in the human journey where uh, there is more change, there's more opportunity, there are more crises, and yep. it's all being galvanized by a little virus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who has popped out of nowhere, shut our world down, and opened up an imaginal possibility the like of which the world has never seen. Mm. And to be uh, in partnership with you as, as you're creating a mind hive and we're embarking on humanity rising and uh, ubiquity university that seeks to be everywhere, you know, unleashing the human potential uh, of, of, of learners uh, everywhere is, is really a high honor. And oh, it's a really deep uh, responsibility uh, that all of us uh, need to take very, very seriously. Uh, so I want to thank you uh, for uh, joining us today. 
Um, and then uh, uh, tomorrow, everyone, we're going to turn to a, a, an issue that, again, like technology and the capacities of, um, of using the internet and computers for all kinds of new uh, possibilities, we're going to turn to the issue of gender. Mm. Look uh, at the issue of gender fluidity. It's also the case that in our generation and within the last few years and bursting all over the world, people are literally popping out of the traditional male, female, patriarchally contained box of gender and sexuality into all kinds of fluidity, transsexuality, pansexuality, intersexuality, uh, in which gender, the very notions of masculine and feminine are being reworked uh, by human experience, human uh, imagination. Uh, and we're gonna be talking with a man uh, uh, who started out as a woman, uh, a transgender uh, individual, uh, Donovan Ackley, a PhD, uh, who has thought very deeply about the history of gender and sexuality and how it's exploding into new forms uh, in the present day. So that's tomorrow on uh, Humanity Rising, uh, same time, same station. Uh, we'll see you there. But uh, Bruce loved our discussion today. I love the vision of Mind High. And I love the vision of Mind High meeting Humanity Rising and everything that we can do together as we move into the future. Thank you. Thanks for your encouragement, Jim. Cheers. Be well. Bye-bye, everyone. We'll see you again here tomorrow.